audiences kind of scattered all over the map, traveling here, there, shopping, last days before Xmas and all of that. And, uh, you know, if you want to call with a different topic that you think is worthy of discussion on this national program, the phone number is 855-407-282. Or if you uh, want to answer some of these questions that we're talking about, about Tourette's syndrome, uh, that's good. Originally, you know, somebody wrote me this, the same gentleman who wrote me that about Tourette, said to me, believe it or not, that it was once considered to be possession by the devil. Would you believe it, how primitive things were? Here it is, wait here. Oh, yeah, he has, uh, yeah, he said that in the old days, they thought that it was a possession. But the first references in the literature to what, to what might today be classified as Tourette syndrome describe individuals who were wrongly believed to be possessed by the devil. But then in 1885, Gilles de la Tourette, a French neurologist, provided the first formal description of this syndrome, which he described as an inherited neurological condition characterized by motor and vocal tics. So before that, you were considered possessed by the devil. Could you imagine what these poor people suffered? What, what they did to them? Can you just imagine? You know, and sometimes I think about how, how advanced we are medically at this stage of human development. And then I wonder, let's say 100 years from now, let's move 50 years at the pace that things are moving. We'll look back to the year 2015, and what will people say about some of the things the medical profession is doing to us today in diagnosis and in treatment? They'll say, oh, my God, how backwards they were. How could they ever have thought such a thing? My God, how stupid they must have been in those days. So I ask myself, well, what might they look back upon with such derision? And I don't have any direct answer. I mean, I have some answers. I mean, I've studied nutrition enough to know that so many things can be ameliorated with uh, the proper diet and nutrition. Certainly not all. That would be crazy. But to rely strictly upon nutrition for all illnesses is equally nuts. You know, there are people who are so fanatical about their beliefs, they think that alternative medicine can treat anything, which is, which is nutty. It's not true. You have to incorporate all of the modalities of medicine, from allopathy to homeopathy and uh, ho uh, herbal medicine, you name it. And it's a difficult thing to incorporate all of them because people want to stick to one field that they know about and dismiss everyone else as nuts. I get it. I think it's the same holistic approach to, to politics that I try to bring to this show as, as well. You know what I'm saying? But uh, looking back at medical procedures of the past, now that I'm on this particular road with you, here, I'll give you an example. Did you know that in the 1880s, 1890s in England, it was fashionable amongst the wealthy? They became so... Uh, 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 disgusted by their own bowel habits. They didn't like the idea that they were human and had to, uh, go to the bathroom. They hated it. They thought it was disgusting. After all, they were such perfect people, right? So they elected to have colostomies. It became fashionable for the rich to bypass their, uh, their lower bowel and have all of the waste matter pass into a rubberized bag on their side, I swear to God, so they could just dispose of it as though it was waste without having to go through the embarrassment of sitting down on a toilet. You say, oh, come on, you're making this up. No, I'm not making it up. It's a medical fact, it, or let's say a sociological medical fact. So you say, well, that was totally crazy of them. Why would they do such a thing? Well, we look back now and say it was crazy of them, yes. So having put things in context on a, on a minor scale, what procedures in medicine today, what practices in medicine, health, nutrition, uh, drugs in particular today, would you think that in 50 years people look back and say, holy God, the human beings of the 2015 era was so stupid that they did that? Back in a minute. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O. I began the show by talking about the unfairness of taxation and how CEO... Apple uh, CEO Tim Cook dismissed the uh, tax avoidant allegations as total political excrement and how embarrassed I am to even have to say that Apple is an American company and how they get away with it is because they placate 
Mao Obama. And I also told you that we're surviving a cultural revolution just barely because the opposition party, the Republicans, have sold themselves out for coal, for oil, for special interests. In other words, they care only about business. They don't care about the culture. And I focus on cultural issues more than I do on economic issues, by the way, if you haven't noticed. If you would analyze my show, you would say my show is more focused on cultural than any other issues, right? I want to read you one of my favorite Mao Zedong quotes to show you how far we have fallen into the morass of this monster in the White House, how so successful he really is. So here is a favorite phrase of the communist revolution, Mao Zedong. When the enemies with guns are annihilated, the enemies without guns still remain. We must not belittle these enemies. When the enemies with guns are annihilated, the enemies without guns still remain. We must not belittle these enemies. Did you hear what I just said to you? So although you're an enemy without guns here in America, they don't underestimate your power. Nancy and the socialist gang understand that you're still an enemy of the way of life that they want to impose upon you. They want total control. They want absolute power. They want absolute socialism, which is absolute power. You don't understand that. Because many of you are still stuck in the, in the, stuck in the idea that socialism means... A workers' peasants' party where they wear little uh, blue suits with little red stars. That's not what it means at all. Hitler was a socialist. I don't know how many different ways I have to say that to you. National socialism. They let the capitalists of Germany thrive. They let the Microsofts, the Apples of their day, make fortunes as they rose to power. You don't understand that. You have to understand it to understand anything that I'm saying to you today. I try to describe it in all of my books, most importantly, in Government Zero. The book is still selling very well because people are starting to catch, finally, the idea that Obama is not what he appears to be, that he is one of the greatest deceivers in the history of America, that he is moving America slowly but surely to its death because he wants to reshape it, and reshape it he's doing. He can't do it legitimately or legally. He knows that. So he does it stealthfully. And his number one goal is to flood America with so many Muslims that the country can never recover, period. One thing you have to understand is that almost all Muslims who come here come from socialist dictatorships. Let's start with that. This is an important point that is often overlooked in the, in the discussion of Muslim immigration. Almost all of them come from socialist tyrannies michael savage no music come on we need some music robert give me any of the platters i wanted uh heavenly shades of night are falling but if you have any of the others let's fire them away let's see what we have i don't know why all right let's move on to something less serious and that is this um show is mainly political if trump wins my career will have been worth the struggle this country has been very good to me and my family I've been working since I'm a little boy. But America's always been a place that if you put your shoulder, I don't know how it go. I don't even know the phrase, to the grindstone or something like that. If you put your shoulder to the grindstone, you'll burn your neck off. I don't know how it, yeah, you put your shoulder to the grindstone, it'll burn your neck off. No, but the thing is, I, I pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. I wouldn't let anything deter me. And I, okay, succeeded. I wouldn't say beyond my wildest dreams. I don't know what that would mean. What, what would that mean? I've written 30 books. I've published 30 books. There are more to come yet. And I am uh, successful in radio. I thank you for that. But, you know, what would it mean to be more successful? What would that mean? More money? Bigger audience? What does that matter? I mean, what does it mean at the end? I don't even know what it means. I would basically be the same person. So how does that matter? So, okay, where do I go from here? I'm really evaluating. It's like the end of the year of that. I'm sorry, evaluation on the air is what's going on. I'm thinking out loud. I have to be careful where I go with this because I may go too far and may disclose certain things I really don't want to disclose on the show right now. i got to watch out for my uh, tendency towards, uh, I wouldn't say Tourette, but maybe to say a little too much at times that are inappropriate and uh, self, self-defeating, I could say. True. But having said that, you know, certain things came up in the last hour. I started talking about Tourette syndrome and got a lot of great calls. We have some amazing calls still on the line. And then I l 
it led to a discussion of some archaic concepts of medicine that we look back upon and laugh at. And I asked you, what might we look back upon and laugh at in 50 years from now that are being done now by ourselves, by our own medical profession? And I've got some great calls on that one. I still have Tourette calls that I want to get to. And uh, some politics that are worth talking about. And I, the biggest political issue to me is the sellout, not of the Republican Party, but of the media. We've lost them. Once we lost the media, we lost this country. And when you see these stooges like Jake Tapper, and I pick him because he's one of the younger liars. He's one of the younger fakers that's being used by the administration to push the cultural and social revolution that will destroy all of us in the end if it's not stopped. These are stupid people. Men like Jake Tapper, who sound intelligent, look intelligent, speak intelligently, or Anderson Cooper, they're actually stupid people. They never see the bigger picture. They don't see how they're being used by the powers that be, nor do they even care. They wouldn't care if they did know. And the end result is very bad for all of us, unless there's a remarkable God intervention. I don't know how this country survives. It's going to take an act of God to save us from this madman, this lunatic. I actually breathe easier knowing that he's in Hawaii. I actually breathe easier knowing that the psycho is out of the country, even though it's part of the country. It's really I live there, it's still out of the country. That's all. I look at the life and death in Shanghai. I look at what Mao Zedong did to China, and I, I really worry about the children and grandchildren in this country. The direction of the fascism that's emerging in our schools and colleges is overwhelmingly frightening. They admit people to the campuses that never belonged there to begin with. They never achieved the scholarship that was necessary to get in. They push them along for social reasons, social engineering reasons. And then when they can't keep up, they invent things and they start screaming and firing professors who are trying to uphold standards. They use phrases like white privilege, uh, safe spaces. It's all nonsense. It's all crap. It's all because they never belonged there to begin with. They never could make it on their own, on their own achievements is what I mean. And so now that they're there and they can't keep up, they've come up with every excuse imaginable to attack those who are trying to uphold even a, uh, a minimal set of standards on the campuses. It's awful to watch this. So here we are. We have this enterprise called radio still existing. Thousands of stations in America. Some run only sports. Some run only, um, I don't know, other stuff. And some run talk. Lots of them run talk. I'm fortunate enough to be on a couple of hundred of those who run talk and have big audiences in each of these stations. But it's not going to be forever. I mean, I, I, I'm going to tell you point blank, whether, whatever it comes to an end, it will come to an end. It will end. It will end. At some point, I will not be on the radio. And what are you going to do then? Well, you'll forget me. That's what you'll do. I don't want to start to sound like Richard Nixon now with, with the checker speech. I'm not doing, I'm not doing a checker speech. But, but nobody is remembered. Nobody is remembered. We live in an, the, the world that we live in today is such that nobody is remembered the next day. They could be gone the next day. Two days later, people forget them. You think that you're... you're so I have always written books. I've, even since I've been a kid, I've always... To me, the written word was king. It was always the thing because they lasted longer, or so I thought. But books have become uh, passe. You know, when you think about it, will books be around in 50 years? I don't know. I don't know. Will the printed word still exist in 50 years? Don't know. But it's, it's my legacy of my writings. It's the thing that will remain. Maybe the recordings that are all over the Internet, on YouTube. I have huge archives that I've had people work on for years, going back 15, 20 years. And some of the material is pretty good. And uh, that's about it. So what am I saying today? I don't even know. Don't even know where I'm going. I'm just kind of talking. Is it okay to just talk without having to make a point? What's that called? I think it's called conversation. <laughs> to talk without having to make a point, I believe, is called f conversation or philosophy. And unfortunately for us, the media is so the opposite that there are no original ideas. It's all stimulation, constant stimulation, constant titillation. Constant excitement, constant alarm. You watch Fox News, the best of them, which is Fox News. Every three seconds, there's another flashing light and another breaking news. Now, there is not that much breaking news in the world, but that's something that they learn, gets the uh, the mice in the cage.